Welcome back to Talk the Walk with me, Sarah Wong. I'm with Joshua Chu, Chief Risk Officer at Collectibles here to talk about all things crypto. Thank you very much, Joshua, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Now, we touched on in part one of some of the technological intricacies of NFT and cryptocurrency in general. Um, now, I wonder, uh, as we mentioned in the intro, what kind of legal considerations arose from that new technological trend and basically a brand new technological ecosystem that is not familiar, that we're not familiar with in the past. And I wonder, can you give us a snapshot of Hong Kong's current legal capacity and to keep up with this new trend and tell us, can it keep up or can it continue to accommodate this new theme? Well, I think uh, what a lot of people has been for has forgotten is that uh, back before Bitcoin had their first uh, uh, spotlight in 2017, most of the world's largest crypto exchange are actually all based in Hong Kong. We had Bitfinex, we had OKCoin, we have Binance. They are all had this Hong Kong connection in the past. So Hong Kong actually has a lot of uh, uh, a lot of attractiveness for this industry, which is why it's a birthplace for so many of the larger crypto organizations we see today. Oh. Now the question is not whether uh, whether we are we are able to catch up as a in terms of legal and regulators to the industry, because let's face it, uh, uh, crypto is just the next evolution of the invention of the internet. The internet has been around for two decades by this time. Yes, uh, back in 2000, we still have a lot of people that actually said the internet is just a fad and it's going to go away. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly, um, uh, that's why making predictions of technologies are so dangerous because now most of the world's largest companies are internet companies. Uh, the problem is, uh, is our education sufficiently helping uh, the profession evolve into this next uh, this next phase of evolution of humanity, we can say that. And the answer is there's still a lot of catching up to do. I want to talk more about education in just a moment, but before, um, to follow on what you said about uh, Hong Kong as a pioneer, actually, for crypto, for crypto. Yes. Um, we know that across the border, China has banned cryptocurrencies, and there's a limited structural regulatory framework for virtual assets in Asia. And I wonder how much of impact will that have on Hong Kong? Well, let's us not uh, forget that China has a very strong commitment to the one country, two system policy. And there's a reason why Hong Kong, it, we are allowed to have our own laws and jurisdiction. So impact wise, I will not say they're significant because Hong Kong will develop our laws based on the needs of the industry. And uh, let us also not forget, while China might have banned crypto for the interim period, they never came out and said they're permanently banning uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, China is still one of the capital for blockchain developments. And in fact, uh, China, uh, if one uh, has to study uh, Chinese policies, we will know that China has always had a far better uh, long-term uh, planning than most uh, other countries around the globe. Uh, uh, this is why there has been many theories that China is uh, waiting and seeing how the industry will be shaped before. Uh, and, uh, and it's really a protective measure to afford people jumping in and speculating and losing, essentially letting all the other jurisdictions uh, take the risk. And they will, uh, by the time it becomes mature enough, perhaps we'll be seeing regulations coming out. Again, I should emphasize China might have, it, the ban was never meant to be, uh, has never been stated to be permanent. Mm. and they are one of the leaders in terms of blockchain technology developments. Uh, the Chinese CDB, uh, Chinese uh, central bank have already uh, been uh, very focal about their intention to launch their own uh, central bank digital currencies. And uh, I, I think that uh, you, you have to take a longer term view on this matter. Uh, in any event, Hong Kong has been quite proactive in promoting our own set of regulations to facilitate right. 
the trade of virtual assets. We have just been consulted. In fact, I have responded to the consultation papers myself on how uh, what are the best laws. The regulators, the uh, SFC, have worked closely with exchanges. Mm. Uh, in the past, and we already have a, a more than one exchange that have successfully obtained the Type 7 license. So I think that we are actually um, uh, going towards the right direction. But back on China, uh, uh, as, a, as a lawyer myself, as a litigator, I, uh, I understand the concept of people learning from their mistakes, but I've always also advocated it's far better to observe people making the mistake and learning from them than making the mistakes and learning it in the painful way myself. So I, this is, uh, this is my, my speculation is that this is uh, really the position of Chinese regulators. The learning, yep. they want to come up with the best policies possible. What about Hong Kong then? What kind of lessons can Hong Kong draw from the regulatory scene overseas? And given what we've seen in the United States about the implosion of terror USD and others, then how do you read the efforts by the Monetary Authority in Hong Kong and in, by the same token, the People's Bank of China in rolling out their own digital currency? Is that incompatible essentially with crypto assets? Well, I disagree. Uh, Terra USD collapsed because it's an algorithmic based uh, stable coin. It, uh, it's uh, unlike USDT or USDC, which are assets, uh, assets backed uh, a stable coin. Uh, it, it's, uh, there's no, uh, it's uh, basically over leveraged. Uh, so uh, mm. just because you call it a stable coin doesn't necessarily mean it is it's a stable, stable coin. <laughs> uh, so you really need to understand, uh, the, uh, understand uh, the nature of the assets, of course. Uh, the, the lesson that I think that uh, regulators from all over the world, not just Hong Kong, can learn is: should there be certain uh, rules in place that will uh, that stable coins issuers have to qualify before being allowed to call themselves a stable coin? Keeping in mind, stable coin have a very unique position that's necessary for trading because uh, it's a very good trade pairs. Mm. Uh, uh, you don't want digital currency with trading pairs with other digital currency, which makes it very hard for normal people to uh, manage. Um, but then again, the USDT collapse, uh, sorry, not USDT collapse, uh, the Terra Luna collapse have shown that USDT was very stable, in fact, because when consumers had that sudden fear, there was essentially a bank run of, uh, of a very significant amount of uh, USDT, and they were able to honor all of their obligations. Uh, you can't see the same thing happening with fiat currency banks. In all fact, right. I, would say that, I would say that it has uh, proven uh, stable coins uh, to a certain extent for this occasion. Now, Joshua, you've earlier said that education is of paramount importance for the new generation of lawyers in order to understand better of the crypto sphere. I wonder how big right now is that cognitive gap between the traditional professionals, uh, such as lawyers and policymakers alike, in the, you know, the new world of blockchain, NFTs and metaverse. How does that new reality reshape the legal landscape? And how, what, what does re-equipment mean for educational institution as well? Uh, it's huge uh, because, uh, let's face it, most lawyers, uh, we are still very much a paper-based profession. Uh, uh, I, I have won multiple cases simply because the opponent did not know how to handle digital evidence. And uh, understanding technology is huge. Right now, we have a lot of lawyers that are catering to the blockchain space, but they're traditional TMT, what we call telecommunications um, uh, media and technology lawyers. But they're not really focused on what, what I would call the BNM space, the blockchain, NFT, and metaverse uh, space. And this is why it's very exciting for us here to actually set the standards of how certain smart contracts should be prepared and implemented and deployed. And uh, and uh, I'm very, uh, and the good part is uh, there are a, a number of academic institution universities that have already reached out to uh, myself to teach the next generation of law students about uh, the potential of, uh, not just the potential of the technology, uh, but how to use it, how to basically have the training early on. Mm, and this is where we're playing catch up. So will all lawyers in the future become developers then, coders? 
Uh, I, believe, I believe that is a unique possibility because we do not have lawyers today in Hong Kong that doesn't use email or doesn't know how to use a computer. Uh, gone are the days when you walk into a law office and the, the only thing on the lawyer's desk is an old calendar. Uh, and uh, and uh, it, all you have to do is look 20 years back. Mo many lawyers are quite uh, opposed to the idea of having a personal computer on their table. But uh, the problem with that is uh, just like when I was in the healthcare practice, when you have paper-based uh, documentation, people cannot read your handwriting, uh, mistakes are made. Computers and technologies are there to solve it. Uh, you do not have title deeds that are handwritten and drafted and gone through a typewriter anymore. We, have, we all use computers and in the future, I strongly believe that lawyers are going to be expected to know how to code. Uh, keeping in mind, the duty of technological competence is actually embedded in the professional conduct of the solicitor's guide. So the whole concept of I'm a lawyer, not a technician, is actually contrary to the professional conduct we are prescribed upon. And each lawyer must keep abreast of the latest development of technology in order to serve their clients properly. Uh, take a recent litigation that I've done, for example, where I successfully persuaded the courts to allow me to uh, ref, uh, basically introduce the use of data rooms to uh, effect legal service. So instead of hire, uh, spending hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, for us complex litigation, sending uh, phone books of uh, legal documents across the globe, we are now able to become paperless and use a single piece of document. It saved my clients over a million dollars. Uh, wow. and, uh, and uh, just on courier fees, yes, I was having a midlife crisis thinking about ch becoming a courier or a photocopier instead uh, <laughs> at that point. But uh, as a lawyer that is not able to keep updated of this latest trend of technology implementation meant that they're wasting their clients significant amounts of time and, uh, and costs, and that can be actually professional misconduct because it's wasted. Wow, that's obviously a topic that can go on for hours, but we have to leave it here um, today. Thank you very much, Joshua, for coming on Talk the Walk. Joshua Chu, technology lawyer and chief risk officer at Quinlectables. Thank you. Thank you for the pleasure of your time.